Okay, thank you everyone for coming. Um, my name is Patrick Doherty. I'm the director of the Smart Strategy Initiative here at the New America Foundation. Um, and Mike, I'm getting a little feedback off the microphone. Uh, I want to quickly thank my partner for this series, uh, Diro Tadani, chair of the DC chapter of the Congress of the New Urbanism. And of course, Richard Jackson, tonight's honored guest. Um, this is in many ways Diru's lecture series, uh, hosted at the New America Foundation. And I'm always grateful to have a space available uh, so that I can continue my education. Um, before Diru introduces Richard Jackson, I want to frame the topic for the smart, non-smart growth practitioners here from the perspective that I take. Um, many of you know that the core work of the Smart Strategy Initiative uh, is to articulate a new grand strategy for the United States uh, that deals with what I think is the major challenge facing the nation, how to lead the transition to global sustainability. Um, our working hypothesis is that, the US has that when the US has executed grand strategies in both World War II and the Cold War, we have let the economy do the strategic heavy lifting. Um, we think the same is necessary today for meeting this challenge of leading the transition to global sustainability. My project today is looking at how the demographic convergence of two major, major generations, the, ma the baby boomers and the millennials, is creating a massive pool of pent up private demand for what I will loosely call smart growth or walkable urbanism or sustainable communities. Um, I happen to think that aiming the nation's economy at unleashing that demand rather than relying on pure Keynesian stimulus or a ruthless period of fiscal austerity is the path to prosperity and one that can underwrite a new era of prosperity and security for our nation. As it happens, a decisive shift to smart growth nationwide will also have ex a lot of extraordinary benefits, from getting out in front of demand for sustainable goods and services from China, to India, China and India, to bringing the $1.8 trillion sitting today in, in money market funds off the sidelines of the financial economy and into the productive economy, and producing the high wage jobs of tomorrow. As it happens, um, our guest today, Richard Jackson, is one of the leaders who understands that this kind of sh the same kind of shift would have a similarly game-changing effect on the nation's health. In fact, because of his work, the CDC evaluated LEAD ND, um, or the U.S. Green Business Council's, Building Council's uh, new certification program for neighborhood development, and confirmed what we all knew years ago, that walkable, sustainable communities are better for public health. In other words, in my imaginary world in which the transition, in which we transition decisively as a nation from sprawl towards walkable urbanism, we also reduce heart disease, obesity, social isolation, and a host of other issues, and get, in one estimate, hundreds of billions of dollars returned to the productive economy and out of the healthcare economy. So it is my great pleasure to welcome Richard Jackson to the stage and introduce and to introduce him, my colleague and partner. Um, Diru Tadani. Come on up, Diru. Oh, thank you. Is the uh, remote here? Yes. Remote. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the second uh, in our series, and um, hopefully Richard will actually state a topic. The last one, uh, Andreas uh, didn't actually uh, talk about what he was supposed to talk about. Uh, so, um, but it was nonetheless uh, a great talk. and. Uh, he didn't even show any of his slides last time, so he just had the first slide up and uh, decided not to address his slides. So anyway, I'm going to try to you know uh, frame some of the issues here, and uh, one of the things that we've been talking about, uh, and I've just tried to make this uh, do these little cartoons that try to express some of the things that we've been uh, dealing with, are the five kind of crises that uh, we are faced today. And uh, one of them is the global housing demand. Uh, there's peak oil, climate change, public health, and uh, the housing demand uh, and supply that's currently on the market. Uh, so we have about 305 million uh, people in the US 2009. Uh, that's supposed to grow by 400 million uh, by um, in the next 30 years. And uh, that's n housing for 95 million more people. Uh, and by 2050, uh, that number is uh, stated to increase to 439, um, which means housing in the next 40 years um, of 100 for 134 million people. Uh, 
If you take those, that's just the U.S. If you take that globally, uh, you know, we're increasing by 2.5 billion people uh, by 2050. What that translates to uh, is that we need to build one city every week that accommodates one million people for the next 50 years, 40 years, okay? And nobody is doing that, okay? Nobody is really facing up to that. But that is the challenge uh, that faces us all today. Um, One city every week for a million people uh, next 40 years. And that will bring us, will get us to the situation of dealing with uh, the number of houses that we need or the households that we need. Okay, we also have this addiction to oil. And, uh, you know, most of us agree that we have reached peak oil. And uh, we're now on that descent. And it's actually, we're depleting our resources faster uh, than we were actually, the, the curve, it always, Hubert's curve always said it was a, a kind of a symmetrical, we'd reach a peak and then it would take that much, that long. But we are actually depleting the sources much faster. And uh, we're all driving much more, et cetera, and we know that. Uh, we also have climate change, uh, and a lot of uh, people are still, some people still in denial of that, especially in my home country of India, where uh, they still don't believe, a lot of politicians still don't believe there's anything uh, like climate change. And my home city of Bombay, two years ago, got 36 inches of rainfall in 24-hour period. So um, if you don't believe something's changing, uh, that should have been real evidence for everybody uh, that things really are changing and then we also have public health. And um, this is a quotation uh, that we used uh, several years ago, actually, just before I met Richard Jackson, and that is, uh, health should be the inevitable byproduct of excellent architecture and community planning. Um, and that's something we kind of forget. Uh, but there is this direct relationship uh, between health and planning, and Richard's going to uh, address that. And then finally, uh, housing demand uh, and supply. Um, you know, we're just building or have been building the wrong type of housing. Uh, you know, there's a very small percentage, uh, you know, 27% of, you know, uh, the two-family, uh, I mean, the two-children family household. Uh, and we're still building houses uh, constantly, thinking that the majority of the marketplace wants four-bedroom, four-garage houses or whatever. So there is this... Uh, real disconnect between the building industry and uh, the supply and demand. And if you look at uh, the scale of, uh, in America, in 1940, uh, the average uh, person had about 250 square feet. That was still, you know, quite large uh, by any standards world, you know, uh, in the world. And today it's like 950 square feet per person in America is what's uh, the average. So, uh, you know, households have got smaller, but the uh, houses, the actual square footage has gotten much larger. So there's this, again, this is disconnected. What we're really missing is uh, those small units uh, where, uh, you know, for the, 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 the single households. Uh, I as uh, Patrick uh, said, I am a member I'm on, on the board of CNU, and we really believe at CNU that... Uh, the Congress is the prescription uh, for all these remedies, is the remedy for all these, uh, these crises. And uh, there's an ad in there. Uh, the refill is if you didn't make it to Atlanta this past year, you should make it to Madison uh, next year uh, in June, June 1 through 4, uh, register to come to Madison for the next Congress. And um, finally, you know, uh, hopefully it's time for change. And... Um, Our speaker tonight, Richard Jackson, uh, is going to uh, address just one of those five issues and what that means uh, in this country. So Richard Jackson, uh, you know, I'm never good at introductions, but Richard is just brilliant. I just had to tell you that. Uh, His current position is the chairman uh, of public health, uh, environmental health at UCLA. And uh, we met about eight years ago in Seaside. And there was a conference, a small group, put together by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And we were all talking about health and planning, and we were at Seaside, and everyone's walking around and feeling really good about themselves. Uh, And we're talking about this connection. Uh, And at some point in this uh, conversation, 
this guy is just vibrating in his seat, uh, angry at what we were talking about or not all the things that we were not talking about. And um, finally, at one point, after two days of conversation, just says, look, you know, I got to stop you guys. I need to tell you what the real truth is about this relationship. And I happen to have this PowerPoint with me. So <laughs> we all kind of looked at him and kind of said, okay, you know, here's this crazy guy. He's going to, he's just jumping out of his skin to tell us something. And it was this incredible talk that he gave us for about 45 minutes that really put everything in context, this entire relationship. Never forget, for, forgotten that talk, Richard, and it was really, and then we met subsequently. Uh, and then we found out a couple of years later, Richard had a book um, out, which is Urban Sprawl and Public Health. There's some order forms. It's uh, published by uh, Island Press, and this was the first book. It's, he's one of three authors. Uh, but he's got two more books coming out, uh, one which is part of a PBS special, and that flyer is outside, and uh, another book with, uh, that's going to be out again, uh, one of three authors by Island Press, which is out pretty soon, I think, uh, in the next month or two, uh, and that's an Island Press. But if you haven't read uh, this particular book, it's worth getting and uh, really worth reading. I also had promised the people at Island uh, to give one more plug for their book, this is a book by Jan Gell, who is uh, the uh, planner who single-handedly uh, changed uh, the... Int if you think that, you know, you can't really change a culture, people say Americans don't walk, they can only walk 300 feet. Uh, but Jan was able to change the culture in a very cold climate in Denmark um, over the last 25 years by slowly converting streets uh, one at a time in Copenhagen uh, to pedestrian streets. And what Jan Gell talks about, well, one of his measures is uh, number of seats per mile. Uh, so he really kind of looks at the idea of benches and places to rest uh, along streets, and something we, we really never think of, and most people would never think of that you need benches, but Jan's entire uh, philosophy has been to insert not only wide pedestrian walkways, et cetera, but always have places to rest that make a lot of sense uh, where they're located. And if you go to Copenhagen now, people really sit outside. Um, it used to be three months out of the year, now it's almost nine months out of the year. And uh, recently, they actually give you electric blankets so you can still sit outside and watch people in, in the cold weather. And it's, uh, I wouldn't have believed it, uh, but uh, it's true. And uh, people actually sit out. The culture has completely changed in the last 25 years to an outdoor culture where people really enjoy uh, sitting outside and um, viewing, uh, uh, watching other people, which is Jan's uh, basic philosophy that people like to watch other people. So that book will be out next week. Uh, it's an Island Press book called Cities for People. And i uh, happy to present my friend Richard Jackson. So, Dero, did you do those drawings? Yes, I did. They were terrific. I really want the one of the houses over time. That's a, in fact, when you were talking about young gal ta uh, um, saying people wanted to watch people, I remember we have three boys, and when they were, they were like five, six, and seven, we'd take them to the zoo, and we'd be standing there watching the animals, and the whole time they'd be watching all the other kids and not paying any attention to the animals. But at least we had an educational <laughs> trip because I'm a pediatrician by training, and um, that's what I wanted to do. My oldest son now is an internist, he, and uh, I said, do you ever see a patient like this, 45-year-old comes in, couple kids, says, Doc, I have low energy. Physical exam looks okay, but weighs too much, the blood pressure is too high, you check the blood, the blood sugar is too high, person's not diabetic yet. They're not spilling it in their urine, the sugar. Cholesterol's too high. They're sort of flat. They look a little depressed. Oh, and I have no exercise. My day is too full, and I spend a couple hours a day sitting in a vehicle. Whoop. So my son's a good doctor. He sends the person to a nutritionist. He's go join a weight loss program, get a pedometer, walk 10,000 steps, get more control over your life, maybe even see a therapist, and what happens a month later? 
Not, how do, oh, you know, the, yeah, I, you heard this already. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. You're exactly right. Doc, the day is too full. I have no time to exercise. There's no place to walk. And what happens? You're good. What happens two months later? Diabetes. Almost. Almost as expensive. He's now on, or she is on, something for the cholesterol, something for the blood pressure, something for the depression. Um, I took the Viagra slide out, but things aren't going well um, for this. So I said, do you see patients like this a day? Ask one of your internist friends, and they will say, I see five of these a day. And what's happened in America is we have medicalized problems that in other cultures we knew how to deal with because of the way we constructed our society. Now, Patrick, you used the wrong term, so I'm going to discipline you on this. We, when, when I was a young medical student, we ran a program on the skyrocketing costs of health care. I misused the term, too, because 7% of all the money in the United States was going to health care. It's now 17%, and we chide our students, it's not health care, it's medical care where we're spending all this money. And we spend precious little less than 1% on really the preventive stuff that really promotes health. And then the other argument I'm going to make is, if you walk down the mall in Washington, D.C., and you start with the Humphrey Building and Health and Human Services, and you go past transportation, well, transportation, that's a health agency. Go past housing, health agency. Energy, well, you know, they have a huge impact. You finally get all the way over to the Pentagon, and they've got a huge health impact and lots of sustainability issues as well. What's my point? That most of the real determinants of health are occurring upstream. That's where these decisions are being made. And we got a bunch of doctors charging huge amounts of money in hospitals and insurance companies and drug companies charging huge amounts of money at the end of the stream, but we're not doing anything to turn the flow. A hundred years ago, people died mainly. The top five killers were infectious diseases of tuberculosis, pneumonia, other things like that. Today, the big killers are, um, and actually the five biggest killers in America in, is heart disease, lung disease, trauma. So trauma is bigger than um, cancer, and I think it's neurologic. I can't remember the fifth one off the top of my head right this second. But these are the big killers, and I'm going to, my thesis is that the our underlying cause of those big killers is in many ways how we have built America. Think about car crashes. Every one of us have lost someone we care about to a car crash, if you're at least close to my age. It is the number one killer between ages um, four and uh, 34, and it's the number two killer for one to three year olds. It's when you actually calculate years of life lost, because there are a lot of years of life lost if you die at age six, um, it is a huge uh, consumer of health care. This is interesting. Look at the difference in car crash death rates in various cities in the United States. Do you notice something about this? Which cities have the highest rate? And I spent 10 years as the director of the Center for Environmental Health at CDC, which is how I first met Diru, because I was invited to come to this meeting. And it was mostly chronic disease people talking about what we eat. And there wasn't enough talk about, wait a minute, how do we engineer exercise out of people's lives and how can we do it? By the way, it's the only time in my life that I ever finally jumped up and insisted that I had to speak because I, the meeting was driving me so crazy. Oh, go back to this. Look at those death rates. Look at Atlanta, look at New York, look at Philly. How many lives would be saved every year if the national car fatality rate was the same as New York City? 24,000 lives a year saved if we had the same death rate as New York City across the country. How about Portland? 15,000 years of life, lives saved. How about Atlanta, how many lives? We would kill 15,000 more people. So this is, you know, this is, by the way, uh, what pediatricians, uh, you know, parents all worry about this thing and that thing. What the docs worry about is trauma, because that's the one that happens so fast. And every one of us have had the experience of walking out and telling somebody their, their child that was perfectly healthy this morning is dead. We worry about trauma, but what, when you think about traffic, and cars and trucks, what's the big killer? 
from traffic, cars, and trucks. It's actually even more than car, uh, trauma. It's air pollution. More people die from the air pollution effects of the way we transport um, in our society than actually die from trauma. The high ozone levels appear high in the afternoon. And during the Olympic Games, we had the chance to run a natural experiment. We in public health love to look at natural experiments and see what happens in the real world. And you can put people in chambers and see that they start gasping for air if you raise the ozone levels high enough. But you actually can show that a whole population has an effect in a short period of time that has political traction, has social traction as well. So during the Olympics, everyone was told not to drive. You may have even remembered this. Everybody expected it to be gridlocks. Everybody got on the MARTA and the air pollution car traffic dropped 30%, and air pollution dropped 30% in Atlanta. So Mike Friedman said, you know, I'm going to go look and see what happens to emergency room visits for children. And there it is. Medicaid claims during the Olympic period versus the other period, Kaiser visits, pediatric emergency visits. Now, the sponsors of Proposition 23 in California who want to roll back the clean air um, efforts in California would say that the traffic really isn't harming anybody and we're overstating air pollution effects. And in, I'm sure they would say the reason that people weren't going to the emergency room during the Olympics was they were having too much fun and they didn't want to go to the ER. But um, other diseases that would not be related to air pollution stayed at the regular rate. They didn't go down. Rob McConnell did a study in Los Angeles about air pollution, and he captured 3,000 kids, 3,500 kids, who you would be proud to be parents of. These were eighth graders who did multiple sports. They were really energetic kids. Um, they went off to high school. He found six high schools in high air pollution areas and six high schools in low air pollution areas, followed these kids for five years, and they were very athletic. By the way, if you breathe, you're exposing your lungs to much more stuff. I'm sorry, if you're exercising much more stuff than otherwise. And at the end of the five years, the asthma rate was three times higher in the kids who were from high air pollution areas. These are big, big costs, and we don't calculate them. You think of a lifetime of having asthma. We need to calculate those effects as well. So the work that you're talking about, Diru and Andres Duwani, 25 percent less vehicle miles if you develop compactly, and we all would agree with that, but 30 percent less ozone air pollution just with that level of compaction where people don't need to be in cars so much of the time. That's a good thing for health. I like your drawings better, and I hope to get your slides. And by the way, you're welcome to my slides, all of you, um, if you would like to use them. But I, I flew here um, over Atlanta, and you, there's just miles of, of stuff that looks just like this. And as you fl fly into uh, Virginia, you see the same thing. The more density we have, the less driving there is, and the opposite is true. But the more we sit in the car, the more likely we are to not exercise enough. In 1985, First time CDC really was doing very good data on obesity prevalence, calling people up and asking them, how tall are you, how much do they weigh? And this is very robust data, 200,000 people a year. No state had more than 15% of the population obese. This is about 1991, and you can see some states are now appearing over 15 to 19% obese. I'm going to skip about 20 slides. And... It's the curse of these things. The battery is, always dies when you don't want it to. No, it's dead. Why don't you try it and see what you get? Yeah, can you just toggle it for me by hand? Is he there? Well, I need the next slide because it, it really is more effective if I have it. <laughs> well, um, you know what's going to happen next. Um, the colors are going to change and the states are going to get darker and redder. And by 2007, we had to add two more different colors to the map of the United States' CDC data. 
And why don't you click the up button and just make it, or hand me the uh, remote. Okay. So there's 2007. You see three new colors um, for uh, the states that are now over 30% obese. Next slide, please. There's 2008, two more states. And we'll come back and talk about Colorado a little more later on. Next slide. So in 1985, no state had more than 15% obese. And next hit, please. Oh, go back. Um, today, all 50 states report, and only one state has less. Thank you very much. Only one state has less than 20%. To go from none over 15% to no state less than 20% over that period of time. Look what's happened to our kids. We've tripled overweight and obesity in, in teenagers and quadrupled it in tweens, um, kids preteens. These are huge numbers. And the implication for the Pentagon and for the defense of this country as well as for health care are really substantial. In fact, I'll stay with this one. I took these slides out. I was state health officer answering to Governor Schwarzenegger for California, and one of my, sec my second priority, my first priority was preparedness. Second priority was the obesity epidemic. And I really had quite a debate because they said, well, obesity is a personal decision. I said, no, when everybody's becoming um, overweight at the same time, that's not a whole bunch of personal decisions. There's something else going on. In epidemiology, we'd call it a common source epidemic. Um, we put in place a fitness gram requirement in California. There was six measures of, of fitness for school-age kids. One of them was, can you run, walk a 12-minute mile? Three quarters of the California high school kids couldn't pass the fitness gram. So on top of this obesity, we've got this shocking loss of fitness in our children at the same time. This is a study done by my co-author, Larry Frank. It's a little hard to read, but in essence, he followed people wearing accelerometers in Atlanta for several days. Um, and what he found was the more time you spend in the car, the more likely you were to be obese. Black, white, young, old, male, female. Kind of knew this, but here's the data that proves it. The more you walk, the less likely you are to obese. All racial groups, all ages. And the higher the density and connectivity, you know, the more connectedness of the place where people are, the lower the rates of obesity. This is a technical slide, and it's really the only one. But this is your body mass index, and it goes up. And I'm not proud of this, but mine's in right about here. So I have four times the risk of becoming diabetic. If I were a woman, I'd have 16 times the risk of di becoming diabetic. Obesity is bad for us. It raises our blood pressure, our risk of a stroke, of having heart disease, of having gallbladder disease, of having liver disease, pancreatitis, joint problems, a baby with a birth defect. Um, but the big thing you worry about most is diabetes because it hugely increases your risk of becoming diabetic. Look at this difference for women. If you, this is where people qualify for the stomach stapling surgery and the insurance companies will pay for it where you have a 35 BMI. These people have 40 times the risk males, 90 times the risk females. And diabetes is an expensive disease. If health care, I have to calculate this again in my head. Medical care in the United States is 17, 18% of the GDP. Diabetes alone is one ninth of that. It's 11% of all the medical care in the United States. So it puts you to close to about 2% of all the money in the United States going to just this one disease. Here's the diabetes rates in 1994. Um, Virginia's here at about four and a half, five percent. A um, little higher, six to seven percent by 2001. And we know that being overweight raises our risk of diabetes. Here it is in 2007. So you walk down the street and in Kentucky and almost 10 percent, 10 percent of the people in Kentucky have a disease that will cost them their eyes, retinopathy, their kidneys, nephropathy, and their feet, gangrene. This was the slide that really got the First Lady of California's attention. At the trends we're going through right now continue, the little girls, think of the little preschoolers that you love the most, and to have 35 to 40 percent of them being diabetic in their lifetime, that's what we are projecting for them. If you become diabetic before age 40, you reduce your lifespan by 15 years and you reduce your quality of life by 20 years. 
your quality of life um, if you're you know, going to dialysis and have gangrene is not going to be very good. I was taught that obesity was bad for me in school. I was not taught that fitness was especially good for me. They just didn't teach that back in, at that time. Here's a study, and maybe you know some of these nurses. 100,000 nurses followed for about 35 years by Harvard. And what they found was what you expected. The nurses who became obese died at a higher rate um, than the nurses who did not. But what do you think happened to the nurses who became unfit, got out of shape? They stayed thin. They had almost as high a death rate. But getting out of shape, not exercising, increased their risk of 60%. And of course, if you get out of shape and don't exercise and become overweight or obese, two and a half times the risk of dying. So suddenly, when, you, when we remove physical activity and the ability to exercise, we are posing huge risks. It's a matter of life or death. I almost think we have a conspiracy against our children. We built magnificent schools in the United States before World War II. Local schools the kids could walk to and, and you were happy and you saw your friends, you could stay after, you didn't need a ride home if you stayed for glee club or sports or something else. And now we have minimum acreage standards, partly so the kids can park their cars when they come all the way to school. Um, and uh, Duro, I think that basically the architects that design these places must do prisons and they're part time because um, they look like medium security schools. My kids, by the way, went to one like this in Atlanta. From two-thirds of our kids walking and biking to school to about one in six, one in seven walking or biking to school. It's a little bit of exercise walking a mile each way, but you multiply that times eight years, it's a fair amount of fat you're burning off and a fair amount of strength that you're building up over that same period of time and resilience. Um, I was thinking about John Gell and how uh, when Americans go to uh, they land in Copenhagen and we get off the plane and we walk through, we always think to ourselves, God, these people look really good. It's, it's really shocking to us how healthy they look, especially if you're <laughs> flying out of Atlanta. Um, this is the rate of walking and bicycling for short trips in uh, um, Germany and Holland. What do you think it is in the U.S. for short trips? 7%. We are worse than Canada <laughs> with their weather. So I, I, everybody knows the environmental challenges, but I'm going to put a medical spin on it. Um, my brother and I were, my wife lives in Berkeley and I live in LA. And um, we were driving up the other day for the Labor Day weekend. We went through Bakersfield and Taft. And I said, you know, this is where the biggest oil spill in American history occurred, right here. And the nice thing about being a passenger nowadays, you can get out the Blackberry and you can do. So I learned that this big oil spill, that they had dug this well that had produced 100 billion barrels a year back in 1910. And the original well was dug with a hand auger at 60 feet. That's how easy it was to get oil back then. So of course we could build an entire economy on cheap and abundant oil. Oops. I, I, if you go over to the Academy of Sciences building, the Keck Center over here, um, etched in stone on the wall is this Keeling curve. And I tell my physician colleagues, no one should graduate grammar school, high school, or especially medical school without knowing what the Keeling curve is. And when I talk to my doctor friends, I say, the patient is respiring. The CO2 levels are going up and down as the patient breathes. And this is, of course, seasonal changes. But if your patient's trend line is going upward, if your patient is retaining CO2, doctor, what does that mean? The prognosis is awful. People that retain CO2 die relatively soon. And I would say that our planet, its continued respirations is trending up and up and up. Imagine to go from 310 when I was a little boy to um, 390 almost in, a, in one lifetime. It's shocking. These are real measurements around the world by real scientists for 150 years and there's the trend line to the temperature of planet Earth. There's the trend line since my grandmother was born. There's the trend line since I was born. And there's the trend line since my son was born. And I, I'm telling you, these millennial students have a very different view of the world 
from previous generations. And I think we should dialogue about this because I think it's extremely important. And we have got to do everything we can to help them cope with the depression a lot of them are feeling about this because it's, it's, it's truly scary. So I was on a talk show once with an overfed, oxycontin, red-faced, overweight white guy on an AM talk show who said, oh, you, you work for the government. You must be uh, um, stupid, um, lazy, or corrupt. That was his greeting for the thing. And I said, no, I, I'm not corrupt, and I'm not lazy, but there's so many things I have to worry about that I often feel pretty ignorant as I have to go through my day. But I said, you know, you have the wrong view of public health because the purpose of public health is not to order you not to smoke and for you to exercise. The purpose of public health is to assure the conditions where people can be healthy. So if we make it hard for you to smoke by laws about smoking and maybe taxes and other things and advertising, um, we're making conditions where you're not going to smoke, but we're not going to go out and force you to stop smoking. Um, and, that's, and it worked very well in California, by the way, and I'll, I can go back to it. Oh, here are the California slides. We always had slightly lower smoker rates than the rest of the country, but we're now down to 44 packs uh, per person per year on average. Taxes worked, anti-tobacco advertising worked. F per capita, 44 uh, packs per capita across the state of California population. The rest of the country is about twice that level. Do you think the cancer dropped as a result of this? It takes about 30 years to harvest cancers. Do you think we had a decline cancer rate? Look at that. Compared to the rest of the country, we've now dropped our throat and, uh, I'm sorry, our lung cancer rates by 21%. Back to that thing, if the whole country had the rate that California did, we'd be saving tens of thousands of lung cancers. And people my age in this room have lost friends to both COPD and to lung cancer because of this disease. Public health does work. Were you, were you able to assign a cost for that? Um, I don't have that research in my head, but th that costing could be done relatively straightforwardly, and there are people that do a lot of this. You know, what would be interesting is actually figure out the cost benefit of like the anti-tobacco advertising. In fact, when I was health officer, one of the hardest battles I had was I had to go over and justify each one of our anti-tobacco ads. And the tobacco industry, and I know I'm being recorded, but I'm going to tell you outright, the tobacco industry wanted all that money to go to medical care. And they even would co-op the medical emergency room docs and others because they'd want the money to go into the medical care and they want nothing to go into the anti-tobacco advertising. And the anti-tobacco advertising that was most effective of all the ads, the one that was most effective was the um, tobacco executives sitting around laughing about how many more kids they were going to addict today because they had just lost 10,000 smokers. And of course it offended the tobacco industry, but that was the one kids really resonated with this thing that I'm being exploited. Um, but the ones that attacked the industry were the ones that were hardest to justify to put on the air. So what's the best exercise? Um, 10,000 steps a day walking. It really does work. By the way, when I would hire Hill staff, I used to love hiring the presidential management. They used to be called interns. Now they're fellows. I don't know why they went from interns to fellows. And... Uh, they would all come down to Atlanta and they'd all gain 10 to 15 pounds because they could walk all the time in Washington and they couldn't walk in Atlanta. Here's a study of 3,000 people followed um, for just six months. Every day they'd go out in a group or five days a week, um, 30 minutes. They lost about 5% of their body weight and they reduced their risk of the disease that cost them their eyes, their kidneys, and their feet by 60%. Nothing works as well. No drug works as well as this. So... Um, we need to start a bunch of campaigns. Here's, here's one called, um, uh, it's for the National Walking Strategy, Walk America. It's easier to get people to bicycle, especially um, fat middle-aged guys like me, but getting people to walk more is, is, is harder, and um, I think that's one we're going to have to push. So at the meeting that Duru was at, Tom Penny, who is the uh, president of the American Institute of Architects, was there and gave the speech. He went home and he redesigned his, his stairway and uh, sent me this slide and said, when I redid my office, I put a pleasant and attractive stairway in, and people are using it all the time. One flight of stairs every single day for a year is one pound of body weight. Multiply that by 30 years, it isn't bad. If you keep your caloric intake the same, 
It really does work. We were able to convince Governor Schwarzenegger to make that state policy that when you walked into a building, you found a pleasant and attractive stairway. You didn't have to take a dirty, dark, dingy, scary, hidden stairway to go up the stairs uh, in a state building, in the new state buildings. Every child in America ought to be able to walk or bike safely to school. My poor little niece in Nutley, New Jersey, was told by her school she was not allowed to bike to school, even though her mother was bicycling with her every single day because, quote unquote, they were afraid of the liability. Well, God help us. I mean, you know, kids that walk and bike to school, concentration's better, alert, mood's better, um, memory and learning are better, they get along better. And Safe Routes to Schools program, and I'm so happy that there's about a half a billion dollars in the transportation bill. It really does work, but you need two things. Just like your computer, you need hardware and you need software. The hardware is you've got to have the sidewalks and the crossings and, and, and that sort of thing. Software is you have to have the political will, the support of the PTA, the administration. But if you have both, it really does work and kids do walk more. And they actually are happier. Any kid that's been sitting in a car or in a classroom all day long is unbearable. You know, you really do want them to, out there running around. Um, we've got to increase green space. Kids need parks, but the, uh, just by dropping uh, the temperature in the area, about four degrees, will reduce ozone levels and, and improve air quality locally as well. I really am I'm so pleased the First Lady has taken up this issue. I know sometimes she's made fun of in, in some of the news stories about why is she picking this. This is going... This obesity epidemic is going to kill more people than smoking at the rate we're going, and I really commend and, and laud her leadership on this. Every child ought to know where food comes from, and they ought to know how good it tastes. And if you really want to change a population, you've got to start very, very young. Kids ought to know where food... By the way, a lot of the teachers don't know how to, where food comes from. Um, schools need to have school gardens. In Lansing, Michigan using hoop houses, Mike Ham and, and the folks in Michigan now are producing food 11 months a year in um, these garden houses with just incandescent bulbs in there and that's all the heat they get. You can't produce it in the dead of January, but otherwise they, they're getting stuff out. When I was health officer, I argued that every community in California had to have a farmer's market because if you're poor, it's easy to walk down the street and get some beer and get some Twinkies and get some other stuff and it's impossible to get decent quality fruits and vegetables. And one of the big battles was to have the EBT cards, the basically the food stamp cards, be usable in farmers markets. It sounds like a bureaucratic triumph, but it was really important to poor people as well. And people say, well, it's an elite thing, just the rich people go to the food, the markets, the f farmers markets, but the truth is the prices go down a lot. And a lot of the poorer people will come about 1.30 in the afternoon where the food is just good quality. It just may not be quite as pretty. The leading agricultural county in the United States in 1945 was Los Angeles, both in quantity of food and value of food produced. We then turned it into a crop of freeways and parking lots and one- and two-story buildings. There's no reason we couldn't be producing huge amounts of food. The, any of you that have a small garden that you're putting a lot, and I'm going to be giving a talk to the landscape architects, and I'm going to argue that they're kind of disdainful about, um, this is my prejudice, about vegetable gardening, and you know they're more into exotic stuff, but everybody needs to have a vegetable garden. It's, pat it's our patriotic duty, just like it was in 1943. Five years ago, if you asked somebody what the walk score, where they lived was, they wouldn't know. And now everybody, I bet, knows what walk score is. If you go to Zillow and look at any of the prices, it's right there. Look up your walk score. Walk score. This is one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this, because when I lived in Atlanta, I lived in a house that had a walk score of zero. It was almost the end of my marriage. Every day at 4 o'clock, my wife and I would have to have this discussion about who was going to three different schools in Atlanta to pick up our kids because they all stayed for after-school activities. Um, I actually was uh, in Michigan, Duru, for about a year working on sustainability. I was, had become convinced that sustainability is the environmental public health issue. Um, it's just for personal reasons, I, my family wasn't able to move, and I finally just decided I'd move back to the West Coast. But the walk score I had there was 49, and I was much better and much happier. Almost done. Um, American Public Health Association has offices a few blocks away. They run the, one of the biggest meetings in America every year, and uh, their next one is in November. 
In the national meeting in 2002, I went through all the abstracts, or just scanned for the word land use. There were zero presentations on land use and public health. 2003, zero. 2005, 55 presentations. 2008, 82 presentations. And last year, 130 presentations. There is a complete engagement by the public health community in these issues. Um, we just started a joint program between urban planning and public health at UCLA. We've had one at Berkeley. We've had it at multiple schools are going on. The kids really like this. And I went back to the millennials. One of the things, and by the way, the people, young people, I'll ask you in this room, but one of the frustrations I think a lot of you are feeling is a lot of your training is so stovepiped and so narrow and feels so disconnected one part from another. And the nice thing about this is it's pulling stuff together in ways that work pretty well for people. Um, this is the Public Health Law Project, and one of the big pushes with this is how do we go upstream and rewrite the general plan? Some places call it the master plan or something else. It again sounds deadly boring, but unless these elements are incorporated into the general plan, it takes about a generation to make it happen. Jan Gell probably did this exact thing in Copenhagen. Eventually it has its impacts. We've got to, and about half of all the general plans have been rewritten with health elements in it. We've got the white coats involved, Kaiser Permanente, the California Medical Association, Catholic Healthcare West, and others have been very positive about making this go forward. Kaiser even has done encouraging programs to people to exercise. I just don't know how they got their safety people to approve of this picture, um, but it's great. Um, complete streets. No state money should be used to rehab a street or build a new street unless it's a complete street with sidewalks. Um, I, I actually like undergrounded utilities and, and proper bike routes, too. Did you see this in Grist? It was really cute. I had to just stick it in there. Can you see it in the back? Okay. So it does work. It takes a vision, and it takes about a generation. But if we have the right vision, and I, I, Patrick, I resonated with, with what you said about if we have the big vision, we can win World War II or rehab Europe or whatever we're going to do, but um, it's not going to happen unless we started out with that vision. Um, I'm going to skip these. This is, I already talked about it, but I'm extremely personally proud of this one. This is the first time the American Academy of Pediatrics, which has written position statements on immunization and hyperactivity and on and on and on, it's the very first time they ever wrote a position statement on land use and, and a guidance they would offer about land use. And the point is children ought to grow up in neighborhoods where they have increasing autonomy, increasing ability to explore the world um, and, and not be isolated as they are in the places that Andres would um, talk about this, and I'm just going to skip. Uh, there's some other political stuff here. You know, this is health impact assessment, but and I, I'm chair of an Academy of Sciences committee on this, but I'm going to put this one off and hold it off for dialogue. Actually, I'm going to say one more quick sentence about it. So big f governmental plans require environmental impact reports, or environmental impact assessments, we call them reports in California. Um, and it looks at, they look at flora and fauna. They think they look at health because they look to see if air pollution standards or water standards are being violated. But they don't really look at health in any kind of integrated sense. So how do we assure that health is actually embedded into these big decisions? How do we make a decision that we're going to go for corn ethanol and never really had a big vision about, well, gee, how could this affect health in one way or another? We're going to put MTB in gasoline. How can this affect health, et cetera? So um, these are where those have been done. I'm working on a policy piece on why the transportation bill was a health bill, and I'm pleased that the secretary has spoken about the importance of non-motorized -motor transportation, and, and I hope when it's reauthorized that there's substantial um, input for that. Let me... Oh, that's the PBS special. Um, so our patient starts to bicycle five miles to the transit center three days a week. A 30-minute bicycle trip burns 250 calories each way. 190-pound um, man, three days a week, 78,000 calories per year. It converts to 22 pounds of body fat. 
at the end of one year, goes back to the doctor, his BMI is down to 24.5, blood pressure is normal, cholesterol is normal, sugar is normal, energy levels and mood is good. His wife has come back to him, he's thrown away the Viagra and he lives happily ever after because we have built communities that really work for people. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Stay up, go and stay up here. Um, <laughs> that was great. Um, I, I, I'm sold. Um, this is incredible. You know, since we are in Washington, since you did just say the word policy, um, I thought I would, and it, we're talking in the healthcare, medical care, public health realm, we just passed something called healthcare reform. And what I thought I'd do is just open, send you a, a softball for the opening question. Thinking about what we just went through in the healthcare reform and thinking about cost containment that hasn't been done and, and, and what we did do um, around access. Could you, what's, what are some of your top talking points here when you talk about the healthcare reform that we just went through and how it relates to uh, the built environment in public health? Um, I don't know if this is something that's on the top of your head, but I just thought I would throw that one out to you since we are here in Washington. We're in the implementation mode of this thing that we call healthcare reform, which is a decidedly mixed bag. And it's going to have some public health implications, but if I had my druthers, I'm just going to keep talking to give you a little bit more time. Um, <laughs> if I had my druthers, I would have done something around the built environment first. I would have put America back, America's, Americans back to work. I would have been putting us on an economic trajectory um, in which we were heading towards more prosperity while building communities that were walkable and sustainable. And then we would have had this built-in cost containment benefit coming out of it. Um, we didn't go there, um, but we do have this health reform. What, what's the impact of that on what we're talking about here today? Do we, do we go backwards, do we go forwards? What are your, just your general thoughts? Uh, three at random, and there's lots more expertise in this room than I have. Um, one is, I, I really do believe this investment in communities that are pleasant. You know, we're, for the PBS special, I'm doing the write-up on Boulder, Colorado, the thinnest city and the thinnest state in the country. And they've now got 200 miles of bicycle routes. You pretty much can get anywhere. Yes, it's a rich place um, with a stable economy and, and a beautiful place. But if you want to bring in bright, creative people, which is what you really need to have to sustain an economy over the long term, they're not going to move to places that they don't want to be. They, they want to go to places like this. So I think the creativity and, and I think that the economic capital is much more tied to social, human, environmental, and other kinds of capital than we give it credit for, and we need to be able to capture that better. B, you know that thing about how all the new studies on built environment and health? The reason I show that is there was absolutely no data in the year 2000 when I was in David Satcher's office with the other center directors when they came out with the Surgeon General's report on physical activity, I guess it was 97. And in 1997, the Surgeon General gave us all this advice about physical activity. There wasn't one word about the built environment, sidewalks, people to get from one place to another, exercise, or anything else. It was all about clinical stuff and nutrition and, and everything else. So there was no research. And my larger point here is there's a lot of reluctance to fund things that we really haven't proven the whole logic sequence. You know, if you really build it, can you prove, you know, if you really, um, if you put a farmer's market in every single poor town, in, can you show that people's blood pressure gets better and they're healthier? I could probably show that they smile more and they're, uh, and they're happier, but to prove they're healthier may take years, and to do a controlled study is very, very difficult. So there's a very strong bias to only doing things that can be proven, which is one of the reasons this has gone out. On the other hand, all of this has gone from being speculative to very substantive. And I, I had to smile because one of my critics was Bill Dietz, the head of the, who did all those maps, uh, and he was the head of nutrition at CDC. Bill's now in Colorado, and they asked him on the front page of the New York Times um, why Colorado and Washington, D.C. were the least fat places in the country, and his answer was, it must be because you have more walkability and more transit. So even the nutritionists have come around. Um, final question before we open up to the floor. Um, Southern California Compass, kind of bringing it back to your own uh, backyard, is the uh, the Southern California uh, Association of Governments or 
project in which they're looking at how do you get away from the freeway and how do you build walkable livable communities given that Southern California is going to be adding 6 million people between now and 2030. Um, to what extent has the public health sector been a part of that process? Um, and have you scored it in some of the same, same ways that you were looking at lead ND um, when you were at CDC? Have you been engaged in that process? Um, and so what are your plans? The, a, uh, there are our grant money that went to the health department for joint projects to look at a lot of this. And B, um, a fair amount of this money is actually going into community um, engagement and uh, decision making. You need a lot of community engagement if you're going to put the subway to the sea or any kind of these transit systems. I fear that no matter how much transit we put into LA, we're still going to be dealing with incredible congestion because of all the people that will be um, added. On the other hand, there is no better biking city in the world. It's flat, the weather's good. There's no reason, um, and just as we ought to have, no reason that everybody shouldn't be biking a whole lot of the time. Um, just as we have safe routes to schools, my students are now arguing for safe routes to universities. Um, because uh, they really take their lives into their hands in any attempt to do it. Um, there is more money coming from some of the foundations as well, uh, but uh, I think this one's still ripening. The, pre uh, the mayor has really stepped up nicely, particularly after he got in a car crash on his bike. That will tend to do it. Uh, okay, so open it up for questions. Phil in the back has, a, has another microphone. Um, if anybody wants to offer up the first question. All right, uh, Puck, thanks for volunteering once again. Sure. Uh, real question uh, I have is the agriculture sector. Uh, do you butt heads with them, or are they on board? I mean, we've got agribusiness, high fructose, uh, corn syrup uh, as the staple of our diets. Uh, we've got 40 years of building that empire. What's the uh, story on how you're going to de uh, decouple that? Earl Butts under Richard Nixon, the Agriculture Secretary, um, basically pushed more towards commodities, not just plant to the hedgerows. Um, we now produce um, huge amounts. We, it's, I want to say, uh, I can't now remember, it's 13 billion or 130 billion in price supports have gone into commodities over the last 10 years. I apologize, I can't remember my zero on this one. but. The commodities, the two big ones are corn and soy. One makes oil, one makes carbohydrates that are big contributors. If you track the price of fresh fruits and vegetables over the last 25, 30 years, they've gone up much faster than the cost of living. If you track um, commodity-based products, um, whether it's McDonald's hamburgers or something else, the price has gone up nowhere near as high. It's an absolute bargain to go out and buy a $2 Happy Meal or $3 Happy Meal um, compared to uh, this other stuff. We created real imbalances in the economic system. And if we're going to give out price supports, God help us, we ought to be giving out price supports for things that are good for people instead of things that are unhealthy for people. It was only a year or two ago that the schools in California were allowed to give the kids at lunch strawberries from the farm across the street because the rules prohibited them if they received commodity products in the school from giving locally grown food. So the, the, I think the places, uh, the whole ag side is absolutely ripe for um, reform. I feel very, very strongly about it. Human beings, I know the advertising is that high fructose corn sugar is natural. Human beings have no business consuming fructose metabolically through the liver looks just like ethanol to the liver. You produce all the carbonyls and all the aldehydes. It is not healthy stuff for people to eat huge amounts of. By the way, sucrose isn't all that great either. If, if, you, know, if you want to have an orange, we ought to be have, eating the whole orange. We shouldn't be eating orange juice. If you want to have a beverage, you, know, you don't need 14 teaspoons of sugar in that 20 ounce beverage. Okay, thanks. I'm just gonna rework our geometry here and, and use this microphone if, if uh, is it on? Mike, if you can turn it on, okay, good. Um, so another question from the floor, anyone who wants to pick up? Um, the lady in the back. Thank you. Um, oh, also, if you can identify yourself, I forgot to introduce Mark Mickleby back in the back corner from the Pentagon, but if you could introduce yourself and your affiliation, that'd be great. Uh, okay, um, I'm Amy Lindsay. I'm with Montgomery County Park and Planning. Um, my particular area of, of um, personal research is uh, children's use of space and access to open space. 
And I'm, I'm kind of curious what your take on uh, part of the situation is, because it seems to me that you've got two pieces of the puzzle here. You've got um, the, the access to the open space and the availability, but it also seems to me that there's a huge sociological problem that, uh, that we've got, and I'm wondering if you've got some thoughts on how to reverse that. Parents generally will not let their children out to play anymore, regardless of the presence of sidewalks, lack of traffic, parks, et cetera. So I grew up in Newark, New Jersey. It's a, it was a tough town then, and yet we were down at Branch Brook Park all the time. We played ball. Um, we were pretty much feral. We went out in the morning on Saturday. We came home when the street lights went on. Um, and uh, I, I think, you know, there are now two entire channels on cable TV that deal with nothing but missing children. And I think the media has overly, um, has greatly increased parents' anxieties way out of proportion. The absolute rate of children being taken by strangers is no different than it was when we were kids. Most abductions are done by family members and by someone the child knows. And our population is much larger. And God knows we know much more about every single one of these episodes that occurs, number one. Two is if you have parks, you have to have policing. You have to have maintenance. they got to be kept clean. You can't just have a park and not have it be sitting out there. Three, our prejudice towards mega parks is ridiculous. My friend of mine was health officer in... Gwinnett County, northeast of, of Atlanta, and he was trying to convince, they received substantial funding, he was trying to convince them to put in a bike route and basically a ribbon park that would connect um, one park to a school, to a retail area, to another park, and the parks district wanted no part of it because that was much more expensive to maintain. They were perfectly happy, and the parks in Gwinnett are drive-to parks. You can't go to the park unless you get in the car to go to the park. In fact, when we were living in Atlanta, my son was a, a long-distance runner. I had to drive him to Chattahoochee Federal Park because there, he could not safely run anywhere where we live. So um, parks are extraordinarily important. They build children's uh, sense of autonomy. Um, I'll talk about this at the Landscape Architects meeting. Bill Sullivan, um, Virginia Kuo did a study in uh, Robert Taylor Homes in Chicago. And these were housing projects that were huge, lots of kids, lots of families. One end of the project was hardened. It was concrete, no trees, no grass, nothing. The other end actually was nicely vegetated. And so they had the graduate students go and just score the quality of the children's play at each end of this housing. It was really an, another elegant natural experiment. And they looked at quality of socialization, how much fighting and fantasy play and all the rest. So this is a tough quiz. Which end do you think the kids were happier and behaved better? Just what you'd think, you know, substantially higher. So uh, no child ought to be expected to grow up um, without a park. Los Angeles is a disgrace. Um, because uh, the very poor parts of Los Angeles, there are virtually no parks. The rich parts of LA, Hollywood, et cetera, there are plenty of parks, and yet um, those are the people who could actually afford to get in the car and go someplace else. The poor people have nowhere to go. I feel pretty passionately about this one. That's great. Um, Richard, before we go to the gentleman in the back with the next question, um, uh, Lead ND, um, uh, CDC obviously uh, evaluated it. Um, what, what was the process was was it much of a heavy lift within CDC to kind of get that project going and move there um, it seems like it's it's such an Im important um, thing to have done um, it is it, now we've seen uh, secretary Sean Donovan adopt lead ND to score to evaluate 3.5 billion worth of, of annual uh, uh, grants uh, coming from his department um, it's so important what was some of the, the story behind that story Three quick ones. Um, the book, um, I started this when I was the director. I left in 03 and went to California to become California's health officer. Howie Frumpkin, the first author, then be took the job I was in, and, and he very much supported the whole built environment issue and has built up a whole coalition and work group on this. Howie um, has moved on. He's now in Seattle. Andy Dannenberg is the person who's the lead on this, and he 
um, was the delegate to Lead ND and had the most to do with it. I think Lead ND is great. I actually was, for a long time, fairly critical of Lead because it would give points for you know having a bike rack, but um, if the bike rack was totally disconnected from anywhere else, it still was the same number of points. And having a bike rack that you can't get to doesn't do you any good. By the way, my son, the doc's pet peeve was that the bike rack at Yale Medical School was way in the back where the guard that was um, uh, you know, when you go in and out of the building, there was a guard sort of there, and there was no reason they couldn't put the bike rack within the sight line of the guard, but they always put it way out of sight, which made anyone going there nervous about doing it. So I'm jumping around on you. I apologize. That's right. That's right. That's okay. um, gentleman in the back, and then we'll come up here to the front. So the, um, yeah, the taller hand is all the way back. Hi, I'm David Levenger, formerly uh, affiliated with the University of Washington College of Built Environment, recently relocated to DC to be Director of Research at Rails to Trails Conservancy. So Wonderful. Thank you for your And talk. Howie Frumkin went, he's yes, the, the new Howie dean at the School of Public Andy Health. Andy is trying to move out too, so. Um, uh, and I'm moving this way, so balance things out. Um, what One of the things that, that uh, the simple question is, where are the anthropologists? But I have a question, an explanation for the question, and that is, I, I find that with so much of the issue related to the problems you're talking about, probably related to the New America Foundation as well, is really tied closely to the issues of cultural change. And I am, trained as an engineer and then educated as an anthropologist, political anthropologist. And to my thinking, because anthropologists are so silent on issues of contemporary cultural change uh, in the US, the elected officials become the de facto experts about what our cultural capacities are. I'm hoping that since you've been focusing on this at such a high level and um, with significant resources. Perhaps you have some positive stories to tell about uh, involving experts in cultural change uh, in the issues uh, uh, in California. And uh, since you've left CDC, perhaps this is something we could connect on later. I, I'm going to give a sideways answer. Um, the California Endowment has funded 13 communities, desperately poor um, bad physical environment communities. One of them is Richmond, California. I know it well. It's the poorest town in, in California. Um, what they've done is created a dialogue process with the community, and there were probably 15 of us on this committee, four or five moms from the community, uh, the planning director, a couple of electeds, the police chief, and others. It was unbelievable the first three meetings, just shocking how difficult the dialogue was. And there was a lot of anger and a lot of suspicion. And one of the things I learned about the planning director is no matter what we said, he'd say, no, you can't do that. And then he would pause because he had been in this dialogue. He'd say, but you know, if you did it this way and worded it this way, we could do this. And it was really fun because towards the end, he, was, he had gone from being this by the book guy, I actually liked him very much, but he, he really had had become much more of a problem solver there. I don't know if the person that was leading it, it was a, a firm there in, in Berkeley that was um, actually making it go forward, had anthropologic training, but it's very much anthropologic. The other thing that was I found quite powerful was just the video uh, remodeling and asking the community, how would you remodel? Because um, you ever know how uh, when you go looking for a house, you tell the real estate agent, I want this, and then you go out and look for the house, and you always shock the real estate agent because you buy something exactly different from what you tell them. And, and it's the, I, I think I want this, and I don't like that. And when you actually get out and look at the real world, even if it's on a computer, you end up condensing down to what you really want. But, uh, you know, in a way, I, I'm going to welcome this challenge because I should probably reach out to the anthropology department at UCLA, which I had never thought about. Thank you. Great. Uh, right up here, and then we'll go back. What, you can wait for that microphone, sir. What steps would you recommend? Tom Whitley, uh, uh, a frequent attendee here. What steps would you recommend to get the medical industry? 
to recognize the enormity of what's being spent for them could be better spent otherwise. And what I like to comment is, is that at one point I was very active here in Washington on planning for the region. And when I went to this one meeting, I said, well, a lot of these transportation re issues are really public health issues. And they got hysterical because the crowd that controls the public health money doesn't want anybody messing around with them. So. Um, wow. One is um, you got to have some of the science as you make these arguments. And the science is, is being put in place. Two is we've done many trainings for the public health people, but all the health officers of California now have bought into it. Virtually, I would say more than half of them actually have a full-time nurse that goes to the planning commission meetings. One of the things that's really striking is the first time the nurse shows up at the planning commission meeting, it's, they're there, dear. What are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. And, and what happens in, after about four months, they're asking, well, how is a child supposed to get back and forth to school bicycling? Or why do we need all these uh, parking spaces? And, and how are we going to police this? And, and a lot of this is the comment I most often get about this talk or variants of this talk is, you know, all you're talking about is common sense. I knew all this. And, and, but I just never thought about it <laughs> this way. And a lot of this is common sense. So it's a matter of just flipping it. Um, there are, I hate to say this, but there are vogues in issues. You know, we had HIV in the 80s, and um, terrorism was the early 2000s, and preparedness. I think the built environment's uh, on a good trajectory. It will eventually um, slip back. What I tell the health people is, look, you don't have to be an expert, but if you can get somebody with a white coat showing up at the planning commission meeting and saying, it's the policy of the Academy of Pediatrics, the kids need to have autonomy, be able to walk and bike to lead their lives, and then leave, that's not a bad thing. And just a simple story about, I took care of three asthmatics yesterday, it goes a long way. Sorry. Quick follow up on that for myself. Um, where is the AMA on this? You talked about the American Academy of Pediatric, Pediatrics. Where is the AMA on, on these issues? Are they moving in there? Or do you have some colleagues to work with? Um, y yes, there have been people at AMA. Um, frankly, the more important one at the first step is the CMA, the California Medical Association, because the, like all these big organizations, of the fill it's sort of like federal legislation. If, if something works in a state, it's more likely to be um, progressed at a federal level. So you have to model some of this stuff at, at a more local and state level. But AMA is not on board that I know of. Hi, thanks. Um, I have, a, I guess, a comment and a question. And the com first comment being, um, well, I've worked, oh yeah, I'm Lindsay Romita. I work for the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Um, and I'm just finishing my master's in public health at GW. and. Um, I think I was really lucky because I got to sit, I got to take classes on climate change and public health and how energy interfaces with public health. But I would really strongly support you as a public health advocate to keep pushing for that health impact assessment curricula and you know really putting that into public health, like every public health school in the nation because I think it's lacking and for the most part. So that's my comment. And then this the question is, um, I think. Um, most states right now are dealing with incredible workforce shortages and extreme budget cuts, and I think um, a lot of states want to do more work on health impact assessments and really working across departments with their chronic disease, you know, on doing these these planning um, programs or at least putting input into planning developments. But um, so the question is. Is there a way, and how do you see it as the best way to leverage resources between planning community, architectural community, and the public health community? Because I think that's really where it's lacking right now is we have people who know what they're doing, but not the resources to be doing it. And it has to come from somewhere. So. Wow. Well, um, one is the power and authority for decisions on housing, transportation, recreation sites and all the rest will all water will always reside in those agencies and s health is not and should not be trying to reconstitute its capacity vis-a-vis -vis every one of them but I, I think we've got to get out of our stovepipe and think that if we're taking care of kids in the immunization clinic which God help me I think is a wonderful thing but we've got to get out of um, 
learn a bit of their language and show up in these settings and empower them, um, ordain them with the authority of public health. And I'm, I'm going to be giving a talk to several thousand landscape architects in a couple of days, and I'm going to lead off by saying the father of landscape architecture, Frederick Law Olmsted, was also the head of the Sanitary Commission during the Civil War under President Lincoln. You are public health leaders, and what you do matters hugely to health. And I think that we have got to confer the mantle of health on our colleagues in these other agencies. Um, and actually making them think about health, I think that's one of the biggest values of health impact assessment, is making them think about health. The worst thing about impact assessment, by the way, is everybody hates environmental impact assessment so much that they don't want to go near another impact assessment process. And um, we're grappling with that. I don't have a quick solution for that one. My name My is student. <laughs> My name's Ann Sweetser. I'm a social medical anthropologist. I'm working as an uh, international development consultant. I wanted to ask you about water. You, you just mentioned it, but you hadn't mentioned it before. Um, quality, access, availability, uh, costs and benefits of poor and adequate water for urban and rural and agriculture and human use. And I'm going to do this in one and a half minutes, OK? Um, one is. Water needs to go into the ground. Having it run off is a bad thing. And any way we can put in swales, pervious concrete, and other ways for water to go in, that water becomes the base flow in any stream. That's the water you want to drink. When you buy bottled water, it's stuff that's come out of the mountain and it's been filtered through the earth. It's what keeps the trees alive. It's what actually, it has huge environmental implications. And if, you, if it all floods off, and, and most urban areas, about 90% of the water floods off, um, that's, of course, the huge risk for flooding at the same time. The city of Los Angeles spends $3 billion a year bringing water in and a billion dollars a year getting rid of water. And my friend Andy Lipkis, who runs Tree People, has been arguing they've now got four or five schools with underground cisterns where they capture the winter water and then use it for the irrigation for the rest of the year. And his vision is like, Actually, I'm going to tell you what my vision for Los Angeles is. One is we capture as much water as possible so that we can use it for our irrigation during the year and keep the place cool. Um, two is we really go back to lots and lots of urban agriculture. It's good exercise. It's good socialization. It gives people, poor people jobs, and, and it's good healthy food and, and locally grown and, and, and sustainable. And three, every roof in Los Angeles needs to have both about one-six skylights because it's super to use fossil fuels when you have that much daylight outside. And the rest of it needs to be fully covered with photovoltaics. Now, that seems like a really narrow issue. Right now, we do not have a feed-through tariff in California. So this is technical. But let's say you own a big warehouse, but you can supply all the electricity for your warehouse by just covering one-third of the roof um, with photovoltaics. But you don't get anything if you put something back into the grid. So literally what's going on now is the crane comes out and puts one-third of the roof with photovoltaics. The rest of the roof bakes in the sun and doesn't generate any energy. But the real cost, of course, was the, it was the crane and the labor. And the and photovoltaics will pay themselves back over some period of time. So we've got to really have a vision of no parking lot, no building roof goes to waste. We're going to generate all that electricity. Um, most of our air pollution is from, oh, well, about a half of it's from cars. The other half is from electrical, I'm overstating it, but electrical generation. And that would be a huge one. Those are three big ones. Um, lots more parks for poor people would be the other one. Thanks. Um, Malcolm Woodland, I'm a psychologist here in DC. Um, I have a, a comment that kind of leads into a question. Um, it's actually, you had uh, talked about D.C. being one of the most healthy cities in the country. And, uh, no, no, the least obese least, in the least obese, national data. Least obese. And, and, and I also wanted to make the point that it's really interesting because it also has the largest fat gap in the country, right? And that is, you know, we have six wards um, to the, what is that, west side of the river that are very, very healthy or less obese. And then we have two wards on the east side of the river where the kids have, you know, roughly about 27% of them are obese. 
and upwards to 40% of them are overweight. So, um, and in that same community, you know, we, we, we talk about this notion of built environment. And, you know, while I've per personally witnessed the built environment change on the uh, west side of that river, on the east side of the river, there are very, very few bike paths in Ward 8. In fact, there are none. Um, no place to even um, 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 hold your bike as you, t as you talk about bike racks. And, you know, I've just seen very, very little change in that pocket of the city. So what I'm wondering here is how do these ideas about built environment and um, the way, you know, communities move, um, um, how do these ideas begin to funnel over into pockets that, um, where the issues are most salient and don't seem to be being addressed? We, we need to hire a bunch of anthropologists. I, and I'm not being flippant, but, but I'm, what I'm really driving at is um, what's culturally appropriate in one place doesn't work sometimes in another place. And um, in the Ozarks in Missouri, there was a tremendous obesity problem. CDC had a project to um, deal with getting people out walking. And culturally, it was not acceptable in the African-American population. That was something that you know, other people do, but we don't go for walks um, all the time. And it took a, a strong engagement of the preachers and the and the part, the leaders of the churches there to really begin. Um, and they had to go out for the walks themselves um, and to start a community walking campaign there. I mean, it's one way to reach that community. The other classic, well, I won't tell that story, but um, I, I, one size does not fit all. But if you have a hardscape that prevents people from doing anything. And, and the line my students use, use is, the built environment is social policy in concrete. And in fact, in the past, highways were put in place exactly to divide poor people and people from color. And, and in fact, they cut through East Orange, New Jersey, when they put in the parkway, a very poor area in parts of Newark, because they wanted to separate one part from another. So. Um, it's going to take a generation to undo that. It's going to take um, political activism and energy from these communities in socially appropriate ways. It's going to take showing up at the meetings and demanding it. What happens too often with poor communities, and I've worked with farm workers, is it comes down to the final thing, uh, the final decision, and somebody's dangling some money and, and they, uh, they opt for a raise in pay. I saw this a lot with other kinds of issues. They opt for a raise in pay rather than the long-term uh, infrastructure changes, and I can fully understand when you're really struggling um, why you would pick that, but we've got to develop the structures that can really enable people to, to do this. And I think we got, uh, you know, the right president to do that. Want to follow up? I just want to add on to his comment. My name is Vernice Woodland, and I'm a resident of Ward 8. I, 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 one, the grand irony is that I live in a community called Congress Heights, and in terms of livability and walkability, I mean, we have sidewalks, we're extremely green. I don't know if it is strictly a cultural, but I do know it is an issue of safety. We went back to that in terms of policing. I think it's a lack of political will. Although we do not have a bike park, it is my understanding that we are expanding the South Capitol Freeway to maybe six, eight lanes, which will feed into Anacostia, where they built a road along the parkway, which was a home to the bald eagle's nest, to be able to get those very same people who someday may gentrify our community in and out to the Department of Homeland Security. So we don't have the political will, but we also have st a very strong and active policy that works against us. We talk about affordable housing. Ward 8 was always affordable housing. Our homes are undervalued. And yet, we continually have um, large apartment complexes in the built environment, which since urban removal or urban, urban renewal have proven to be socially and economically not viable in the long term. So I, I and also the fact that, um, Stereotypes aside, as I look around this room, I don't really see Ward 8 represented, except for the three of us, and we're all related. So, uh, <laughs> so this message does not get to our officials 
it does it certainly doesn't get to the community and so I think we have to look at different ways of engaging and 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 presenting that that message so we're doing a lot of work um, with people down near the port of Los Angeles Long Beach um, 30,000 diesel trucks go rumbling through there every day and the, the air quality is terrible uh, noise the injury issues um, and Basically, the folks that are working there are doing a lot of community engagement, teaching people how to, um, what, what this, this air pollutant mean, how you can go to a hearing and make your arguments in a cogent way. Here's the data for your community. Because um, sooner or later, an outsider can't present this data, but oftentimes the folks that live in these communities really don't have access or the for that matter, the education to be able to capture what's going on. They need to know they're getting six times as much diesel air pollutants as somebody that's living um, five miles away, and they need to argue that cogently at the hearing. Um, you can't, um, somebody from UCLA um, is not going to be able to do that. It's got to be the community. So I think you're right. The community engagement's got to occur. Politicians will, will do what they do, um, but they do respond to pressure because that's their job take a whack at that for a little bit um, from my more amateur status on this issue right now the way that this transformation towards walkable communities has been moving has been moving through market forces um, and given that we've got the the current federal and state subsidies supporting sprawl the where that's happened where the market is acting is at the high end um, essentially the my, my perception of the way this market is working is that if the wealthy people want it, then, then, that's, then they're going to get it. The, the, there, there's, a, there's a response to that market demand signal. Um, and that the big range, the, the, whether it's Fannie and Freddie or Department of Transportation or whatever it is that's, that's kind of subsidizing the suburban system that we've got, is locking out kind of middle America. And what you what we've just seen now with, with CNU uh, 18 in Atlanta was Housing and Urban Development Sec Secretary Sean Donovan announcing that Lead ND would be utilized for $3.5 billion worth of HUD grants. And that's going to that's going to help kind of at the low income end, but you're but but these communities are not just low income, right? And and so you're still going to have a lot of those residents who are going to who, who are going to be in who are going to be victims of that continuing um, public policy, um, and so these other policies that supersede it, whether it's the highway to, to DHS or whatever it is, it are going to are still going to ruin the neighborhood. Um, and it what it's going to take is, I think, a full spectrum transition towards sustainable communities, so that the whole Metro DC is moving in that direction, and then you're going to have communities with the with the legitimate capability to take their own future into their own hands and make their decisions not at the whims of kind of the high end market forces, but at at their own pace at their own discretion. So I, I don't know if that helps, but I think that's part of the part of the picture, at least from where I, where I stand. Um, right here. Well, actually, you know what? I promised to the guy in the red tie. <laughs> And I got to deliver on that one, so right. Thank you. Um, my name is David Livingston from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Also known as the guy with the red tie. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, you mentioned briefly uh, President Obama's announcement uh, on Labor Day about uh, new infrastructure spending um, and the $50 billion uh, package that he's proposing. And along with that came desire for um, a reauthorization of a transportation bill that not only, um, you know, uh, maintains and builds an ambitious, you know, thousands and thousands of miles of roads, uh, but also commits to high-speed rail, uh, moves that into the service transportation program so that uh, it's it's funded, um, and that pays attention to 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 trying to shift um, national strategy away from just the unimodal uh, highway-only system uh, that 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 we mostly live in now. Um, it seems that's a it's not a cheap proposition to do that um, and I, I would I would ask you in a deficit constrained environment like we live in right now um, and especially after the election uh, with the political changes that might take place 
if you were advising the White House or if you were testifying um, in your own capacity as an expert in front of Congress, how do you make the link? Um, and unfortunately, you know, the economic return on investment uh, in this in environment, you know, trumps the social return on investment. How do you make the case that that public health um, gives you an economic return on investment and integrating public health into the next transportation bill in a far more proactive way um, will, will create beneficial returns to municipalities, to states, and to the federal government. I was wondering if maybe you have a particular success story, a series of success stories, um, direct links. Just one success story because we're running out of time. Here. Okay. The average lifespan in the United States in 1900 was 35 years. Lifespan today is more than twice that. M most of that improvement, all but five years of that improvement, came from public health, economic, social, and infrastructural interventions. You know, uh, heated homes, less crowding, clean water, clean air, clean food, safer jobs. That's really what, and, and immunization. I mean, immunization pays about $20 back for every dollar you spend. These are absolute bargains that public health can do. We can, I, I did a paper on the removal of lead from gasoline in America. My blood lead in 1970 was, a, was 22. The average blood lead in a child born today is 0.5. Every child born in America has been given a gift of six IQ points, and the net economic benefit for each year's cohort of that IQ um, gift is about um, $200 billion. One can actually cost out the benefits of this. Public health has been very slow about really doing costing of these benefits. I, I have my health and, and you have yours because we're living on the infrastructure, both the social infrastructure and the physical infrastructure and the health infrastructure that our grandparents put in place. And we have an obligation to put the same kind of infrastructure in place for our grandchildren. No, it's not going to get better in the short term of a year or two, but you can show genuine benefits. Copenhagen, after 20 years, is a totally livable place. So I, I don't think it's realistic to expect the president's going to show a return on investment in one to two years. That's my personal opinion. Okay, I'm very aware that we've gone past our 7 o'clock uh, end time, and I want to thank Richard Jackson for an incredible presentation, um, inspiring, just really... Um, uh, again, continued my adult education once again. Um, and thank you again also to Diru Tadani um, for uh, being a great co-host of this and the inspiration for it. And we'll see you again hopefully in October. Um, and uh, the the uh, uh, personality to be TBD, but it looks like Diru has something else to say. No, no, I'm just going to uh, give you my copy for New America Foundation of Richard's book. And Richard's going to sign that for you. Oh, great. So. Thank you so much. This is outstanding.